<laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> So far this year, I have distributed 70,000 condoms. <laughs> I am the condom queen. <laughs> you may also know me as Lex. I work in the Office of Health Promotion, and part of my job is to encourage safe behavior. I'd like to recognize the, the Flourish Steering Team and the Good Life Speaker Team for the terrific job they've been doing in this series especially Jason and Melissa, and Courtney, Albert, and Hannah. I don't know if all of you are here, but I know some of you are. <laughs> Flourish Emory, empowering each and every Emory student to become more optimistic, happy, and satisfied. Flourish Emory believes that student success goes beyond academic achievement and reaching career goals. Student success, by definition, must include living a purposeful life, a life that has deep meaning for each individual, and one that is fully integrated into the fabric of Emory community and the world. My list of elements of flourishing, which may be different from someone else's. Meaning and purpose, play, the power of love, resilience and vaccinations, I'll explain that. <laughs> Point of view, only bring a carry on, and vulnerability as a strength. <laughs> Stole that from Bruce. <laughs> I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about myself. I was born June 24th, 1949, which will make me 66 this summer and yay, retirement. Um, <laughs> my family lived in what was then a small community of Northbrook, Illinois. Northbrook today is a major suburb of Chicago and it bears little resemblance to the place where I grew up. When I was 12, my family moved to California. My father flew commercial jetliners, 747s to be exact, and he reached the prestigious rank of captain. He was always away a lot, and we were accustomed to living most of the time with Adam. He was a stern man, but a s sort of reckless man. And I'll never forget his habit of tailgating. He tailgated so close that if the other driver had hiccuped, my dad would have caused a serious collision. And he would have blamed the hiccup. More on that later. My mother had wonderful and endearing qualities. Sobriety was not one of them. She did have a killer sense of humor. When she really got going, she could have an entire room full of people in stitches in a matter of minutes. She loved sports, she carried a 10 handicap on the golf course, and she was what we thought was the perfect match for my dad, and I still think she was. Mom and Dad. <laughs> she birthed three sons and two daughters. All five of us grew up in the drug-infested waters of the 60s. None of us disappeared down that rabbit hole. However, I don't think it was the result of great parenting. <laughs> In retrospect, I think it would be a fair description to call my siblings and me free-range children. <laughs> we learned to look after ourselves. Once again, more on that later. Here's me and the sibs. <laughs> Being the daughter of an airline pilot, it seemed perfectly normal for me to learn to fly. I took my first solo flight when I was 18. When I tell people that, they're aghast. But in my world, it wasn't that unusual. Two of my brothers and a nephew grew up to be airline pilots as well. <laughs> there I am. So that's me and my imagination. More on that, too. In my mid-twenties, 
I got involved with an organization called Synanon. Its original reason for being was to treat heroin addiction. Back then, you may find this surprising, but it's true, heroin addiction was considered to be incurable. Most of the people who used heroin in the U.S. would never be free of the drug. Synanon was the first privately funded and operated live-in drug rehabilitation center in the country. This is a bunch of us building a tensegrity, and you can ask me about that later if you wish. <laughs> but those of us my age probably remember Buckminster Fuller. <laughs> Synanon overcame narcotics addiction with a group interaction called the game. Residents participated in these leaderless games lasting two or three hours each, roughly three times a week. Nine or ten people would sit facing each other in a circle and they talk, yell, and cry. You could say anything. The only rule was no physical violence and no threat of physical violence. It could be uproariously funny, nothing like a great put down. And it could be harsh and emotionally tough. It was never, ever boring. The community that grew around Synanon looked and acted like a very sophisticated commune, sort of an alternative lifestyle at a time during the 60s and 70s when many people were searching for a new and better way to live. I moved into that 24 hour a day roller coaster ride in 1974 and I stayed for 15 years. I was what was referred to as a square. Someone who came for the lifestyle as opposed to someone who came for the cure. If I knew then what I know now, so here I am and I ask myself, how do I talk about flourishing and living the good life? I have a feeling there's not a person on the planet who hasn't wished at one time or another that they could relive an experience, take another shot at getting it right. Well, that doesn't seem to be available to us in this lifetime. So maybe the closest thing we can do that is anything like that is listening to others. Listening to the mistakes they made, listening to their stories of victories, defeats, joys, and sorrows, and use their stories as a starting point to flourishing. But do we really learn from the experiences of others? I don't think so. Just my opinion. We can argue over it. Over, we can argue it over coffee later if you want. I just don't think we listen hard enough. I don't think we try to see ourselves squarely in someone else's shoes and really try to understand why they made the life choices they made, how they ended up the person they became. Now let's change that question to can we learn from the experience of others? I would say of course, but I think it takes a lot of persistence and determination to do it. I think it takes an extraordinary person and an extraordinary effort to do so. So why am I saying this? I would challenge you to do something extraordinary today. Listen to the experiences I'm going to share and really get inside them. See yourself in the shoes of the people I talk about and wonder what you would have done with some of the same challenges. It is my sincere hope that doing that will allow you to create a platform much higher than the one I started with and I hope it will lead you to flourish in ways you never imagined. It is my sincere hope that it helps you lead a good life. The trait to flourishing is meaning and purpose. Giving back, pursuing something bigger than yourself, and doing it in a way that satisfies your soul. What material success does is provide you with the ability to concentrate on other things that really matter. And that is being able to make a difference, not only in your own life, but in other people's lives.
That is Oprah Winfrey. I grew up with the assumption that one day I would get married and have kids. That was sort of the way it was back then. To look at us from the outside, my family looked like the Nelson family of the hit show Ozzie and Harriet. For those of you too young to remember Ozzie and Harriet, they were like the Cosbys without a deep lesson at the end. They were the Kardashians without any money. They were modern family without any diversity, controversy, conflict, and without a sense of humor. <laughs> it was the 50s. We took what we could get. My expectation of a husband and kids ended up half fulfilled. I couldn't have children. I wanted to nurture young life, and although I wouldn't have said it back then, I wanted to flourish. We lived in one of the biggest counties in, in California, home to one of its major cities. Time went by and I heard that the county had a youth mentor program, and that seemed like a perfect step for me to take. I went through the rigors of being trained and being vetted. I met with the head of the mentor program. She was a live wire. I was so happy to engage with her over something as important as mentoring a child. Once trained, the next step was to choose a mentee. I wish they, we should coin a better word than mentee. It sounds like uh, breath mint. Um, <laughs> The process was to first review files of some of the youngsters that wanted mentors. And then you would choose three, three of those files, interview the children, and choose one. So the first file that Julie showed me was for a girl who had been interviewed by four different people and never chosen. When I heard that she was in foster care because her mother had both AIDS and Crohn's disease, and my husband has Crohn's disease, I didn't even look at the other files. I told her I didn't want to know about the other kids, that this girl was the one for me. I met Denisa on her 13th birthday. Target stores in California, much to their credit, maybe nationwide, I don't know, they gave a $25 gift certificate to every kid in foster care celebrating a birthday. So our first outing was purposeful. We went to get her something to celebrate year number 13. The trip was one I'll never forget. It was the most graphic demonstration of the line between childhood and adulthood walked by young teens. She had some savings, so she had enough to buy two items. Her first was a bright pink Hello Kitty CD player. So appropriate, so cute. Her second gift was the loudest gangsta rap CD I'd ever heard. <laughs> Those two gifts spoke volumes about who she was and what the next few years were going to be like. On the ride home, I pulled my seatbelt a little bit tighter than usual. Denisa lived in what was called a group home. It was much more of a prison than a home. In fact, it had been a mental institution complete with padded cells. The ultimate horror is the folks that ran that group home, they were using those padded cells to restrict the children for hours at a time and as a punishment. The kids rarely went outside the cinder block walls that enclosed the home and they even attended school on site. For the first several months that I visited Denisa, she was not allowed to leave the property. This was her punishment for coming late to school, not bathing regularly, whatever, sassing. Now this was a kid who was all but abandoned by the world. As I saw her, she was so far beyond despair the expectations of promptness and hygiene were like trying to put a band-aid on cancer. I had to get creative about how I spent my few hours a week with her. I wrangled permission to spend our time together in a conference room where we could at least talk, although that was very slow going for quite a while. She barely said a word. 
I found out that she loved to read, so I made regular trips to the library, shuttling books back and forth for her. She had lost library privileges for returning books late. How ironic that reading, an unmatched source of self-education, was denied her. One of my fondest memories of Denisa was when I secretly painted a portrait of her. I worked from a photo I had taken on her 16th birthday, and I'm quite proud of that bit of artwork. So I decided to have some fun with her. When it was finished, I brought it to a small gallery whose owner consented to hanging it. Shortly thereafter, on a really beautiful San Diego summer eve, all of the galleries on the block where my painting hung collaborated in a collective opening. I took Denisa without telling her anything about my painting. I just let her go. I suggested she wander through the galleries without me and enjoy the event at her own pace. Some time later, I heard Denise's voice far off in the distance. Oh my God! <laughs> she spent the rest of the evening standing by her portrait and making sure people knew that she was the model. <laughs> she was thrilled and for months, if someone at school made her feel bad, she'd say, has anyone ever painted a portrait of you? <laughs> Eventually, Denisa was moved to a more typical group home in a very modest California suburb. For the next five years, she had four girls about her age as housemates with a revolving group of staff to supervise them, and she attended public school. But this was not the Cosbys. Her housemates were mostly hardened young women, some of them nasty and contentious and often looking to take it out on someone else. She got in her share of fights, and trouble followed her the entire time I was her mentor. There is more to tell about Denisa, and I will come back to her and bring you up to the present. But first I'd like to talk a little bit about mistakes. <laughs> I love James Thurber. This is about play. Better to have loafed and lost than never to have loafed at all. <laughs> Einstein had it right. I've made my share of mistakes. Sometimes I've made mistakes that I've learned from and never repeated. Other times I've made the same mistake over and over again. And I believe it was Einstein who said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. If you accept his definition, I am certifiably insane. <laughs> Owning a business was one of the biggest challenges I've ever taken on. There's no boss to tell you what to do, what not to do, and whatever you do or whatever you don't do will result in success, mediocrity, or failure. The world of the proprietor is loaded with lessons and it taught me some doozies. <laughs> the business that Bruce and I owned was called Spotlight Specialties. We had a client base that included some of America's greatest companies, Hewlett Packard, the Walt Disney Company, Johnson & Johnson, Hilton Hotels, and more. At its most rudimentary, we sold customized merchandise. Everything from limited edition wearables for special events, executive thank you gifts, and at its most sophisticated, we designed product marketing programs, usually for small niche products, and we did some work in customer satisfaction as well. The things we did well, we did really well. Unfortunately, neither of us had a nose for getting the help that we needed to sustain ourselves. What's the point of making money when you don't have time to enjoy it? This is a bit of a cautionary tale, and it's told from that good old 2020 hindsight. We worked like dogs to build our business. At times we were both working a minimum of 60 hours a week and it was not unusual to tack on all of Saturday and half of Sunday on top of that 60 hours. We worked through meals. We worked through holidays. 
we worked while we were on vacation. We were so busy that when we moved into a new house, I was on the phone the entire time the movers were there placing the furniture. I supervised the whole thing by pointing and grunting. <laughs> by most standards, our business was really successful. We had the resources to buy a house twice the size of the one we lived in. We belonged to the neighborhood racket club. We both drove cars we were proud of, and we gave money away. But in my heart, I know our blind commitment to doing it all ourselves, not getting the support we needed, not getting a fresh look at the amazing world we live in, kept us from being truly happy. Now, I know Jason said we can do questions and answers at the end, but I wanted to know if anyone can tell me why Flourish Emory was created. Yeah. Jason? <laughs> you just said it, right? Um, to spread flourishing to, you know, people in Emory. That's true. And Mark had done some, Mark Cordone had done some focus groups with Emory students and found that the following sentence kept coming up. Emory students are willing to sacrifice their wellness in order to succeed. And I wonder if any of the students in the audience, I suppose any of the other people too, um, if you've approached your studies the way that Bruce and I approached our business. Yep. All days, all hours, day or night, past the point of exhaustion, exclusion of the things that are fun or the things that make you feel good. Now back to Denisa. In our life, there is a single color as on an artist's palette, which provides the meaning of life and art. It is the color of love. And that is from the great painter Marc Chagall. My happiest moments with Denisa always involved one of two things. Boogie boarding at the beach, rollerblading, some other fun activity. We must have been a sight. Go and the other is going out to see and meet important people people who succeeded against long odds, people whom I hoped might inspire her. On one especially great Sunday, I was able to take her to meet the Tuskegee Airmen. For those of you who are not familiar with the Tuskegee Airmen, they were the first African American military aviators in the United States Armed Forces. During World War II, African Americans in many U.S. states were still, still subject to Jim Crow laws and the American military was still racially segregated. The Tuskegee Airmen made heroic contributions to the Allied victory in spite of the shadow of racism and in spite of the discrimination that they suffered. The opportunity to meet this amazing group of courageous soldiers are such an important part of U.S. history was not lost on Denisa. The icing on the cake was that she was taken on her first airplane ride by one of the pilots at the event and he had the good sense to invite her to sit in the front seat with him. I really slept well that night. <laughs> the next famous person we met had a story that was much closer to home for Denisa. I managed to secure tickets to see Antoine Fisher when he came to San Diego. For those of you who don't know who he is, his story was told in a major motion picture called The Antoine Fisher Story, starring Denzel Washington. Antoine was born in prison. He was taken into foster care immediately after birth and was placed at a preacher's home where he was horribly abused both physically and sexually. He ran away, lied about his age, and joined the Navy. He was constantly getting into fights. Luckily for him, he met and befriended a Navy psychiatrist who turned it all around for him. After many years in the Navy, he became a security guard at one of the big movie studios in LA. At one point, the studio offered to pay him for the rights to his story. 
But Antoine said, how much are you paying the script writer? He lobbied for the job and got it. He wrote the screenplay for the movie about himself and has been a script writer ever since. He often makes time to speak to and then individually meet foster kids in California. And Denisa met Antoine Fisher. But I think my most memorable time with Denisa was when Maya Angelou came to town. I had heard and seen her speak before in a, a more charismatic and electrifying presence I have never seen. I was happily able to track down really good tickets for us. There's no reason in particular that I should have expected Denisa to know who Maya Angelou was. But then Miss Angelou never missed an opportunity to let people know. Her presentation style mixed electrifying speech. Several songs that she breaks into in the middle of speaking and her poetry which is also just beautifully woven into her presentation. I had so hoped that Denisa would be captivated by her. I was hoping maybe she had read about her in school or in magazine article. I hoped she knew how important she was. We sat down in our upfront seats and the program began. About halfway through her talk, I peeked out of the corner of my eye and I saw that Denisa was silently reciting every poem word for word along with Maya Angelou. She had memorized every one of them. And I guess I worried about her not understanding who she was listening to was for nothing. Denisa is a 25-year-old new mother, and she just posted this on her Facebook page last week. Every day when I wake up, I thank God for the tiny blessing that is my son. My new family saved me from the path I was on. My son's smile gives me life, and there's nothing I won't do to keep one on his face. How many of you here are between the ages of 20 and 25? Quite a few. Are, are there things in Denise's story that you can identify with? Or is it so completely different from yours that it's hard to put yourself in her shoes? I invite you to take a little trip in her shoes. This is a young woman who never woke up in a house where somebody got up in the morning, showered, and went to work. This is a woman who spent most of her youth being argued with, fought with. This is such a different life than most of our students have experienced, and I invite you to, to try and imagine it. This is resilience, vaccinations, and goodbyes. Resilience is accepting your new reality, even if it's less good than the one you had before spoken by Elizabeth Edwards. And if you don't know who that is, I'll tell you afterwards <laughs> and why she said it. When you say goodbye, make sure you really feel it. It's fun to be young and reckless. After all, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. The only problem is sometimes events in your life overwhelm you. Sometimes all you need to do is seek the counsel of a dear friend. Other times, it's really good to call a pro. I've had several occasions in my life when professional counseling was incredibly valuable to me, especially in contrast to the times that I should have sought counseling and did not. One of those times when I'm quite sure I could have benefited from counseling was when I had a hysterectomy at a young age and knew I could never have children. On the other side of the ledger, I had the good sense to seek counseling when my mother called to tell me that she and her sister both had terminal breast cancer. I didn't wait until I was having trouble coping. I just went ahead and said, I know I'm going to be in trouble here and got help. Dealing with the loss of loved ones is one of the most painful and difficult things 
we have to do as human beings. I am forever grateful to the people who helped me through the next three years. I lost the equal to the number of starters on a football team in three years. My mother, my father, my nephew, my sister-in-law, and more. I don't know how I would have handled that grief without help. My mother left us in 1989. She succumbed to breast cancer after spitting in its face for years. Her first round with cancer was fought in 1975. A mastectomy and the determination of a pit bull got her through that one. In fact, she left the hospital with a pump still surgically implanted and went on a camping trip with my dad in Africa two weeks after her surgery. She didn't have time to get a prosthesis, so she shoved a dish towel in her bra the entire trip. The recurrence some 13 years later was not so easily dismissed and she lost the second fight. I am so grateful that I had the opportunity to tell her I loved her one last time and to say goodbye. Two years after her passing, I was visiting my brother in Denver and as luck would have it, my father and his new bride were going to fly into Denver to spend some time with us. Now, my dad was a really gifted mechanic, but as I've said before, a little bit of a wild man. And he is, was fearless. I say this because the plane he flew in was a glass air that he built himself. A glass air is an aerobatic plane. You might get a clearer picture of it if you imagine a Porsche with wings. And of course, in the sky, there are no speed limits. After a few lovely days with my family, we took Dad to the airport to bid him farewell and bid them both farewell on their journey home to Long Beach. We stood by as he gassed up the plane and safety checked and fired her up for the ride. Losing my mother just two short years before had been a constant reminder of how important goodbyes are. I bid my father farewell like it was the last time I would ever see him. And it was. A few hours later, we got a call from the airport. Dad had radioed in a distress signal, and they had not arrived at their destination. They were thought to have gone down over the Rockies. And the folks at the Civil Air Patrol had only a vague idea where to look for them. We passed that night with no word, the same with the next day, and the next night, and the next day, and the next night. And then on the fifth day, we got the news we were dreading to hear. They were found with the plane. They had landed, but the plane couldn't handle the impact of landing on such difficult terrain. It was felt they had died instantly on impact with a berm. It's sort of a little mound of earth that juts up. I am truly grateful that my mother's death had taught me how to say goodbye. It's all in your point of view. I have always believed, and I still believe, that whatever good or bad fortune may come our way, we can always give it meaning and transform it into something of value. Hermana Hesse, one of the great authors that everybody my age read. Maybe the most important Japanese movie ever made was one called Rashomon. It was released in 1950 and was made by Akira Kurosawa, whom few would argue was the foremost Japanese filmmaker of all time. Rashomon starts in an abandoned gatehouse in a downpour of rain where three men have taken refuge. One is a priest, another a woodcutter, and they're recounting the story of a murdered samurai. As the story unfolds, new characters are introduced and you start to realize that every single person who witnessed any part of the murder has a very different description of the events. 
For me, it was the most amazing and dramatic example of the world of different points of view that I've ever seen. I won't tell you any more. Perhaps you'll see it someday, and I'd recommend it. There aren't many better ways to be entertained if you have a free hour or two. Now, I will always love my mom and dad, but their child-rearing skills left something to be desired. When I was eight years old, I fell in love with the boxcar children. I don't know if any of you remember that series of books. It was about orphans living in an abandoned rail car. The story just captivated me, and it led me to the conclusion that I could live that way too. So I packed up a bunch of food in a blanket, hobo style. I found my three-year-old sister and my six-year-old brother, and the three of us ran away from home. We ran through the field next to our house. It was heaven. We walked and walked. We sat down and ate. We walked some more. That was the life. At dusk, that tall, that field of tall grasses, it changed from warm and friendly to hell on earth. We were sure the owls were dive bombing us. What other evil creatures were lurking in that grass? We raced home screaming for our lives. We made it just in the nick of time. I was sure we had been eaten by now had we not made our big escape. So we get home, pretty afraid we're in big trouble. Turns out mom and dad didn't notice we were gone. <laughs> You'd have thought they'd at least heard that there wasn't any noise in the house would lead them to the re realization that we weren't there. Not a chance. There were so many ways we were not watched carefully enough. Supervision was always minimal. During the winter, we rode our bicycles in the snow and ice to the outdoor skating rink in town. We'd tie our skates, laces together, put them here. Here's the kicker. The road into the ice skating rink was a 50 mile an hour, one lane each way road with snow piled up on the side. Woo -hoo. I began cooking many of our meals when I was in high school just out of self-preservation. We just never knew if there would be a meal or what it might taste like. This is where the point of view part comes in. Some children who were raised this way become massively insecure. Some get angry at their parents, and they can't let it go. They spend their whole lives being pissed off. For whatever reason, being raised like that made me into a more self-reliant person. It made me more resourceful, and I never resented my parents for it. I might get some argument for this comment. But I firmly believe that most of the things that anger us, the things that annoy us, the things that disappoint us, the things that hurt us, can be put into perspective with a simple change of point of view. For instance, the next time you drive down the street and someone cuts you off, instead of cursing them aloud, instead of calling them a name and wishing they could hear it, tell yourself, never attribute to malice that which you can attribute to stupidity. <laughs> All of a sudden, what you considered an attack just becomes an act of stupidity. Much more forgivable sin if it's a sin at all. You've taken out the element of intent, and it makes all the difference. Now, take it a step further. Just imagine the person in that car that cut you off is headed to the funeral of a loved one are going to extend their last goodbyes to a grandmother who is old and not expected to live another day. They cut you off because they were so preoccupied with a sad and painful loss that they never even knew they cut you off. Now you've turned anger and angst into compassion and the world is a better place because you've changed your point of view. No, that's my parents. <laughs>
style. <laughs> Only bring a carry-on. Someone said that adversity builds character, but someone else said adversity reveals character. I'm pleasantly surprised with my resilience. I persevere, and not just blindly. I take the best, get rid of the rest, and move on, realizing that you can make a choice to take the good. Spoken by that great philosopher, Brooke Shields. <laughs> If you are easily offended, please know that this next section is going to be about marriage, sex, and getting emotional clutter out of your closet. So now's your chance to slip out if you can't hear about sex. Okay, you had your chance. <laughs> Another way to say it is when your life changes direction, it's your opportunity to let go of the worst of it and hold on to the best. Only, hang, only bring your carry-on. You don't need the excess baggage. My second marriage was, let's just call it an experience. I forgot who said this, but to some folks, the word experience is a euphemism for a mistake. At first, he was kind, generous, caring and thoughtful. It was what I thought marriage should be. But over time, slowly but surely, he became overbearing and manipulative. He mandated that I not watch sports because women didn't watch sports. Maybe he said ladies, I don't remember. He wanted to dictate what clothing I wore. It's a battle I never lost, but it's one that hurt me and wore me down. But the worst thing that he did was shame me for being fat. This turned me into some sort of a weird prisoner in my own home. I eventually stopped letting him see me naked. That was only, the only way I could stop the nasty comments. Bruce, and that's not him, that's Bruce. <laughs> I didn't think you guys needed to see him. Bruce and I got together some months after the divorce. And the first night that I stayed with Bruce, I was keenly aware and grateful that he thought I was beautiful. The next morning, I was the first one to wake up. When I started to get dressed, I just decided that I was not going to put on a stitch of clothing until Bruce was up. I was not going to bring that don't let him see you naked into the new marriage. I had to prove to myself that no nasty barb was coming, nothing to undermine my confidence. No pronouncement would be made to hold me down. So even though I sat shivering in a chair until Bruce finally got up, it was worth the wait because those would be the first three free steps I had taken in years. Bruce told me how beautiful I was. And then we watched a football game on TV. <laughs> so sometimes it's best to leave your old baggage behind. Dump that big old suitcase, never look back. Times of change are opportunities to decide what baggage we want to continue lugging around. The choice is our own. The power of vulnerability. The difficult thing is that vulnerability is the first thing I look for in you and the last thing I'm willing to show you. In you, it's courage and daring. In me, it's weakness. That's from Brene Brown. Very early one Sunday morning, about 25 years ago, a dear friend of ours walked into our house, walked into our bedroom, sat down on our bed, and burst into tears. We were sound asleep, so needless to say, we were surprised. Turns out his father had been murdered the night before. His wife followed shortly, and the four of us sat and talked. Buddy had been up all night crying. He obviously couldn't sleep, and the longer this went on, the less control he had over his emotions. We urged his wife, Lori, to call his doctor since they had his private number. 
And you should know that Lori is one of the most self-prepossessed people I know. She's smart. She's confident. She never seems to lose her balance. But as you can imagine, this day was different. I'll never forget her response because she said, but that's an emergency line. We're only supposed to call when it's an emergency. I don't remember exactly how we responded, but needless to say, she did finally call the doctor. There are many lessons in this story, but, at the, the, but the core of Lori's response was a profound difficulty in asking for help and an inability to turn off autopilot. This is part of my next story. These are the people who literally saved my butt. Fast forward about 20 years. In 2011, I was diagnosed with stage 3B colon cancer. I've never been punched in the face, but I learned that day what it must feel like. And I did what I always do in crisis situations. I went numb. That's not a choice I make. That's just what I do. After I go numb, I engage. I start organizing everything in my life in a frantic dash to take control. I set up auto payment for the mortgage, for every credit card, and for every regular bill we got. I bought all the loose-fitting clothes I would need in the process of undergoing treatment. Busy, 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 clean, organize. Don't think. I believe we are all capable of being vulnerable without being weak. I always try to remember that you can stand up to what you're afraid of, experience the worst possible outcome, and remain standing. Well, I was certainly afraid of cancer, and I didn't have a lot of choice about whether to stand up to it or not. I did find out that it was a lot easier it was a lot easier to smile with a bunch of friends going along for the ride. Something deep inside of me makes it really difficult to accept help. I don't know whether it's an implied obligation or if I'm trying to avoid inconveniencing other people, but I definitely struggle with it. Having cancer changed my mind about how to respond to a friend's offer of help. More than once, Bruce overheard me on the telephone saying, oh, we're fine, we don't need a thing, when in fact our world was just caving in around us. I don't remember what the next slide is. Oh, <laughs> My friends taught me a lesson while I had cancer that I will cherish for the rest of my life. They taught me that when they offer help, they want to help. They taught me that accepting their generosity was truly a gift to them as well as to me. Vulnerability is really a strength, not a weakness. Before, I'd wrap, before I wrap up, I'd like to acknowledge one of the most rewarding and important relationships of my life and the one that is true for many people. And that's the one we have with our partner or our spouse. Although I had a couple of trial runs, <laughs> The third time was definitely the charm for me. <laughs> Bruce has been the most wonderful and supportive husband I could ask for. I have not once felt unloved or unloving in the 33 years that we've been together. I sincerely hope for those in the audience who want it that you are as lucky as I have been. So I'm going to recap what we're talking about. Tools for flourishing. Look for opportunities to add meaning for your life. Remember to play. Love is powerful and use it. Get regular vaccinations with the healthcare professional of your choice to keep up your resilience. And I mean both physical and emotional. Look at your life from both sides. Only bring a carry-on, and remember that vulnerability is a strength. Thank you.